Sì, allora buongiorno a tutti, scusateci ancora per, per il ritardo. Prima di iniziare questo evento lascio eh, la parola al preside dell'Università di Ingegneria che è venuto a porgerci i suoi saluti. Eh, buongiorno a tutti, probabilmente sarebbe meglio e più politico di parlare in inglese, ma credo che per gli studenti prefer that I speak uh, Italian. So ho detto che forse era più educato <laughs> parlare in inglese, ma probabilmente voi aveste preferito almeno il mio breve saluto uh, in italiano. Indubbiamente è un evento, devo dire che sei anche un po' arrabbiato che non abbiamo cominciato aspettando, ma insomma vi ho detto che poi un quarto d'ora, 20 minuti a Napoli, poi non è, non è la fine del mondo. E, uh, è un evento atteso, anche visto il gran numero di, appunto, eh, di presenze. Credo che sia un personaggio eh, importante, diciamo, indubbiamente con, con delle eccezionalità. Quindi forse parlerà anche qualcosa a sorpresa, vedo che sta, sta preparando ancora qualcosa. E quindi credo che sarà, diciamo, interessante... E seguire la sua, la sua uh, relazione. Beh, questa facoltà uh, ha, uh, come dire, quasi ogni giorno c'è un qualche evento, dai più tradizionali, o non so, poche settimane fa c'è stato un evento sulla storia dell'ingegneria, il primo congresso nazionale sulla storia dell'ingegneria, che eh, la, la, la storia di questa facoltà parte 195 anni fa, 4 marzo 1811, è una storia lunghissima, c'è anche in gran parte la storia dell'ingegneria italiana che esce da questa facoltà e, e, beh, e oggi siamo come dire, nel, nel futuro con la presentazione eh, che sentiremo. Devo ringraziare ai, gli studenti di Ingegneria Senza Frontiere che, che è della del Denaluc che diciamo sono stati molto attenti e cortesi per fare nei, preparare questa iniziativa diciamo, ho una sincera ammirazione per lui perché, per loro perché molti di loro si, si sacrificano anche andando fuori facendo diciamo ho una sincera ammirazione perché sono persone che si dedicano veramente tanto rischiando anche qui diciamo anche ci sta chi è stato fuori molti mesi e e anche ha avuto dei problemi personali stando fuori in Africa piuttosto che, che in altre regioni del mondo è un'iniziativa bellissima questa cioè anche gli ingegneri hanno un cuore che diciamo non è, è, non è poca cosa bene, non, non vi rubo più neanche un secondo e ripasso la parola agli organizzatori che hanno il difficile compito di gestire questo evento grazie Grazie al Preside Cosenza per averci permesso tutto ciò, perché dobbiamo ricordare che ha spostato anche una seduta di laurea per lasciarci l'aula magna. Adesso passo un attimo la parola al rappresentante di Ingegneria Senza Frontiere Napoli, in modo che possa esporvi uh, sia la nostra associazione che i perché, uh, il perché abbiamo scelto di appoggiare questo evento, abbiamo fatto di tutto per avere Richard Stallman qui a Napoli. Prego. Uh, buongiorno, sono Francesco Paraggio, ingegnere senza frontiere in Napoli. Prima di tutto volevo dare il benvenuto a Richard Stallman, il nostro ospite che non ha bisogno di presentazioni. Poi volevo ringraziare te, a nome dell'associazione il preside Edoardo Cosenza, il gruppo di utenti uh, Green Linux di Napoli e il presidente dell'associazione Francesco Pomicino, ingegnere senza frontiere. Allora, sono brevissimo. Ingegnere senza frontiere in Napoli è un'associazione di promozione sociale che è nata nel 2004. Oh, scusate nel 2004 e si occupa di cooperazione internazionale seguendo tre binari principali quello della formazione, quello della ricerca e quello della progettazione in loco tra i suoi associati abbiamo studenti, ricercatori, docenti e professionisti tutti impegnati in progetti e gruppi di lavoro che partono dal territorio locale quindi con i nomi di, di Scampia o con le case popolari di Chiaiano o in progetti dell'università di ricerca come il progetto di rilevamento per i paesi in via di sviluppo o lo sviluppo di tecnologie quali l'eolico sempre per i paesi in via di sviluppo oppure in 
progetti di vera cooperazione internazionale in luoghi geograficamente molto lontani da noi come il Madagascar, il Nicaragua, la Repubblica Democratica del Congo dove si cerca con piccoli, piccole azioni di dare risposte ad esigenze contingenti della popolazione locale. Allora, sarò brevissimo nel, nello, nello spiegare perché sia uh, Ingegneria Senza Frontiere Napoli il gruppo di utenti GNU Linux di Napoli e la Free Software Foundation seguono, seguono allo stesso tavolo. Condividiamo tra di noi lo, la ricerca continua di un utilizzo appropriato delle tecnologie, quindi una tecnologia che non è proprietà de, né di macchine né di uh, proprietà di qualcuno, ma è un prodotto della conoscenza umana e quindi qualcosa di libero. Questo concetto di tecnologia appropriata deriva dalle parole di, di, di Gandhi, che ne è stato per un precursore, che delegherava un ruolo importantissimo alle tecnologie, un ruolo, un ruolo fondamentale nella lotta per l'indipendenza dell'India contro l'impero britannico. Gandhi proponeva dei sistemi di, di gestione cooperativa su piccola scala, diffusi sul territorio e decentrata contro il monopolio e l'arroganza dell'imperialismo britannico quindi delle tecnologie che migliorano le condizioni di vita, che, sono, che economicamente usano in maniera saggia le risorse del pianeta e quindi anche le risorse umane, intellettuali delle persone, rispettano gli equilibri naturali e quindi la, rispettano la libertà delle persone e decentrano tra la gente il governo della cosa pubblica. Vabbè, ora vorrei lasciare la parola a Richard Stallman, che è il nostro ospite attesissimo. Grazie. Allora, giusto una piccola presentazione per, per Richard Stan. Una presentazione. Vabbè, adesso. Are you ready? No problem. Aspettiamo solo. Aspettiamo solo qualche minuto così si prepara per la sua presentazione, poi dopo io in chiusura. Io poi in chiusura. In chiusura presenterò il Nalug e l'Hack Lab che hanno anche collaborato per la realizzazione di questo evento. La parola a Richard Salman. I have some possibly bad news. There will not be translation today because uh, they can't do simultaneous translation and there's no time for consecutive translation. I did tell them this weeks ago, but oh well. So you'll just have to listen to me in English. And I'm... All I can do is uh, express my regrets to those who, who would have needed translation. What is free software? Free software means software that respects the user's freedom. When software is not free, that means it is proprietary software, non-free software. Proprietary software keeps the users divided and helpless, divide and conquer. They're divided because everyone is forbidden to share with anyone else. And they are helpless because <clears throat> nobody has the source code, so nobody can change the program or even independently check what it does. And thus, proprietary software puts its developer in a position of power over the users. That's why it is an injustice. But what specifically do we mean by respect the user's freedom? What freedom is that? We always have to be specific. It's never enough just to say we're in favor of freedom because the crucial questions are always the specifics. What freedom should everyone have? 
Free software means that the user has four essential freedoms. These are the definition of free software. These four freedoms are also the human rights that I believe every user of software is entitled to, without exception. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish, for whatever purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code of the program and change it to do what you want. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor. That's the freedom to make copies and distribute them to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to help your community. That's the freedom to distribute or publish modified versions when you wish. With all four of these freedoms, the software is free software, which means it is distributed in an ethical system that respects the user's freedoms. If one of these freedoms is missing, then the program is non-free software and it shouldn't be being distributed at all. Its development is not a contribution to society if people have to give up their freedom in order to use it. But why are these four freedoms the essential freedoms? Why define free software this way? Freedom two is essential on basic moral grounds so that you can live an upright life as a member of a community. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor, the freedom to distribute copies to others. If you use a program that does not give you freedom two, then you are in danger of falling at any moment into a moral dilemma. Whenever your friend says, that's a nice program, could I have a copy? At that moment, you will have to choose between two evils. One evil is give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. The other evil is deny your friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. Being in the situation, you ought to choose the lesser of the two evils. The lesser evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. This evil is lesser because we can presume that your friend has treated you well, is a good person, and that you would want to help your friend. We can presume this because the other case, where that person is a nasty person who's not really your friend, that's simple. You say, why should I help you? That's, that case is easy. So we have to look at the case which is difficult. The case which is difficult is where that person really is a friend and really is a nice person and you normally want to cooperate. So. You shouldn't, try, you shouldn't do evil to that person. Instead, you should do wrong to the developer of the program because he deserves it. He has deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community. So if you can't help doing some kind of wrong to someone, aim it at him. That makes it less bad. However, to be the lesser evil does not mean it is good. It's never a good thing to make an agreement and then violate it. Some agreements are inherently evil, like this one, and it's better to violate them than keep them. But it's never good. And an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program is not a good thing. The only thing that's worse is an authorized copy of the proprietary program because it does the same moral harm to the community and in addition, the perpetrator of the scheme profits from it, usually. 
So, although this is the lesser evil, it's not really what you should do. What you should really do is avoid being in the dilemma. And there are two ways to avoid it. One is, don't have any friends. <laughs> That's the method that the proprietary software developers prefer. The other method is, don't use this proprietary program. If you don't have a copy, then you can't fall into the dilemma. That's the method I use. If someone offers me a program, provided I, or anything good and useful that people might like, then if, if I'm offered it under the condition of promising not to share it, any kind of generally useful technical information, I refuse. I say, if I can't share it with you, I won't take it. I will not get it for myself through betrayal of the rest of society. The most important resource of any society is not a physical resource. It's a psychosocial resource. It's the spirit of goodwill the spirit of helping your neighbor. This resource makes the difference between a livable society and a dog-eat-dog -dog jungle. If you have a portable tracking device, please switch it off. <laughs> they, have, they have already tracked you here. They already know you're listening to me. So you don't need to keep telling them. You can switch it off. And if they want to listen to my speech, well, they're welcome to come. This is why I don't have a portable telephone. I believe it is the citizen's duty to refuse to carry a tracking device. I'm sure they're convenient, but they're... Some things are more important than convenience, and this is one of them. So, <clears throat> it's no coincidence that the world's major religions for thousands of years have explicitly promoted this spirit of goodwill, because anything that can raise the level of this spirit even a little bit makes life better for everyone. Whether those religions have had any effect, I don't know. <clears throat> In any case, what does it mean when powerful social institutions say that it's wrong to help your neighbor? What are they doing? They're poisoning this vital resource something that no society can afford. No society has too much spirit of goodwill. We can't afford to throw it away. And what does it mean when they say that if you share with your neighbor, you're a pirate? What are they doing? They are trying to equate helping your neighbor with attacking ships. And nothing could be more wrong than that, because helping your neighbor is admirable, but attacking ships is very, very wrong. So they're not similar, and we should refuse to use their propaganda term, pirate. If someone else starts talking about piracy and asks me what I think about it, I say, I think it's very wrong to attack ships. I refuse to be drawn by other people into repeating the enemy's propaganda terms. And what does it mean when they impose harsh punishments like years in prison on people who share with their neighbors? How much fear will it take before your neighbors are too scared to help you? 
how much fear will it take before you are too scared to help them? If you don't want to live in a society permeated by this level of fear, you need to take action to put an end to the proprietary software developers terror campaign. I call it a terror campaign for a specific reason. In two countries, the proprietary software developers have threatened the public with rape for having unauthorized copies of proprietary software. And I think that threatening people with rape constitutes a terror campaign. So that's the reason for freedom number two, the freedom to help your neighbor, the freedom to make copies and distribute them to others when you wish. Freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose, is necessary for a different reason. So you can control your own computer and your own activities that you do with your computer. It may be surprising, but there are proprietary programs that even restrict the running of an authorized copy. They restrict who's allowed to use it, or how many people are allowed to use it, or what job it can be used for. And this is obviously not having control of your own computing. So Freedom Zero is essential, but it's not enough. Because Freedom Zero is only the freedom to do or not do whatever the developer already decided. To really have control of your computing, you need freedom number one, which is the freedom to study the source code of the program and then change it to do what you want. That way, you make the decision instead of the developer imposing his decision on you. <clears throat> However, well, if you don't have the source code, and thus you don't have freedom number one, then you can't even tell independently what the program is doing. And many non-free programs have malicious features, features put in not to serve the user, but rather to spy on the user, restrict the user, or attack the user. For instance, Spy features are quite common. One proprietary program that, ha that you might have heard of that spies on the user is called Windows XP. <laughs> when the user of Windows, and I won't say you because you wouldn't use a program like this. When the user of Windows searches for a word in his files, Windows sends a message to Microsoft saying what word was searched for. And, oh, that's one spy feature. And when Windows XP asks for an upgrade, it's sends Microsoft a list of all the programs installed on the machine. That's another spy feature. <clears throat> now, Microsoft did not tell us about these spy features. People had to find them. And it wasn't easy. For instance, the list of installed programs is sent in encrypted form, which means you can't easily tell what the information is. People had to do some clever research to figure out what information was being sent. Mm. <laughs> Is there any chance of finding me some hot tea? A large amount, like half a liter? 
with milk but no lemon. Thank you. Regular Pepsi will also work. Regular Pepsi will also work. <clears throat> but spy features are not limited to Windows. Windows Media Player also spies on the user. It does total surveillance. It reports everything that the user looks at. But please don't think that spying is something that only Microsoft would do. Microsoft is just one among many proprietary software developers and basically they're all doing the same evil thing, which is making proprietary software. And many of them take the power that this gives them and use it to mistreat people in other ways. For instance, RealPlayer also spies on the user in the same way. What was that sound I just heard? No, I'm just wondering, was that the sound of windows? Oh, good, good. Oh, I don't mind if you use your computer, that's okay. So, <clears throat> RealPlayer also reports everything that the user looks at. And so does the TiVo. It reports everything that the user watches. Total surveillance. Now, the TiVo is an interesting case because the TiVo contains a lot of free software. In fact, it contains a small GNU slash Linux system. And many people in the free software community applauded the TiVo when it came out. They said, ah, they're using our software. How nice of them. Which is sort of backwards, you see. It should be how nice for them. Everybody's welcome to use our software, but when they do, they are benefiting from us. That's not giving us something, that's receiving from us. We should make a distinction between the people who benefit from our work and from benef between benefiting from our work and contributing to our work. And we should thank people when they contribute. We don't have to thank them when they get the benefits of our work, then they should thank us. Meanwhile, the TiVo also contains non-free software and it spies on the user. And this shows us that the goal should not be that products use free software, meaning use some free software. The goal has to be use no non-free software, reject non-free software completely. And that's the aim of, of the free software movement. We want to escape from non-free software and we want to help the whole world escape from non-free software forever. So, malicious features <coughs> don't stop with spying. Some malicious features are designed to restrict the user. There's the functionality of refusing to function. Where the program says, I don't want to show you this file. I don't want to let you copy this file. I don't want to print this file for you because you're not good enough. This is also known as DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, where the program is designed to refuse to work for you. <clears throat> and then there are back doors. Now, there was a proprietary program called Interbase, which was liberated. And once it was free software, the users looked at the source code and they saw it had a back door. So they took it out. They fixed it. But when it was proprietary, the users couldn't tell. 
It presumably had the same back door, perhaps for years, but the users had no way to discover this. They were vulnerable. Another proprietary program with a back door that you might have heard of is called Windows XP. <laughs> When Windows XP asks for an upgrade, Microsoft knows the user's identity. So Microsoft can deliver to the user an upgrade designed specifically for her, which means it can take total control of her computer and do whatever it wants. That's the back door we know about. Is there another? In India, I was told that they had arrested some programmers working on development of Windows XP and accused them of working also for Al-Qaeda, saying that they were trying to put in another backdoor that Microsoft was not supposed to be aware of. Apparently, that attempt failed. Was there another attempt that succeeded? We have no way of checking. We can't tell. And Microsoft was also caught putting in a backdoor for the National Security Agency back in 1999. So you can't trust non-free software. This is not to say that all developers of non-free software put in malicious features. The point is you can't tell Non-free software is trust me software. Just trust me. So even though there are some proprietary software developers that don't do this, you can't really tell who they are, so you can't ever trust them. Meanwhile, those non-free software developers that do sincerely try to develop the program to run so as to serve the user's wishes are still human, so they make mistakes. They write errors in their code. They can't help it. And the user is just as helpless against an accidental error, an unintentional error in the code, as he is against a deliberate malicious feature. If you use a program without freedom number one, you're a prisoner of your software. We, the developers of free software, are human too. We also make mistakes. There are errors in our programs also. All non-trivial programs have bugs. The difference is that we respect your freedom to fix the bugs in our code. We don't keep you a prisoner of our mistakes, let alone our malice, because we believe in respecting your freedom. You are free to change our code. What, For whatever reason you don't like what it does, you are free to change it. <clears throat> And free software is generally entirely free of malicious features. And the reason is programmers think of putting in malicious features when they believe they can get away with it. The developer of a proprietary program already has power over the users. So he faces the temptation to put in a malicious feature knowing the users can't take it out. But we free software developers, even if you suppose that we were tempted in the same way, that if, even if we suppose that our consciences are not stronger than the other people's, we realize we can't get away with it. Because we know the users would find the malicious features and take them out. We don't have power, so we can't force our malicious features on you. And we know this, so we don't try. So these are the reasons why freedom one is essential. 
Freedom one is the freedom to personally study the source code and change it to do what you want. But freedom one is not enough because there are millions of people who use computers and don't know how to program. They can't personally exercise freedom number one. But even for us programmers, freedom number one is not enough because there's just too much software. In fact, there's too much free software. There's so much free software that nobody could possibly master all the, the software that she uses and make personally all the changes that she might want to make. That's beyond the capacity of one human being. So the only way we can fully take control of our software and make all the changes that we want is to do it working together, cooperating. And for this, we need freedom three, the freedom to publish or distribute modified versions when you wish, the freedom to help your community. With this freedom, we can work together. Suppose there are a million users of a certain free program, and they want a, a million users who want a certain change. There might be 10 million others who don't care, but a million people want the change. Well, by chance, we'd expect there'll be some thousands of them that know how to program. One of these days, a few of them will make the change using Freedom One, and then they will publish their modified version, which is exercising Freedom Three. And then all those million people can switch to that version and get the change they wanted. They don't know how to program, but they still indirectly get the benefit of freedoms one and three. So every user can directly exercise freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, and freedom two, the freedom to make copies and distribute them when you wish. Only programmers can directly exercise freedoms one and three because that involves programming. But once they do, everybody gets the benefit. So all four freedoms are essential to everyone, directly or indirectly. So I think I will start again because uh, it's a long talk. So what if there are 
just a thousand people who want a certain change in a free program and suppose none of them knows how to program they can still get the benefit of the four freedoms here's how they do it one of them posts an announcement saying I would I wish someone would make this change is there anyone else who also wants it and the other thousand people will write back saying I want it and then they can start an organization the idea of the organization is that they all become members and they all pay dues and the organization uses that money to pay someone to make the change so for instance suppose it's a fairly big change the organization might charge a hundred euro and then if a thousand people join it will have a hundred thousand euro well that's enough to pay two programmers to work for a year so they could make a pretty big change if it's a smaller change they might just want 10 euro from each member in order to spend the money they have to choose programmers to hire so they can talk to some programmers and say when could you make this change and what would you charge and then they can ask some other programmers when would, could you make this change and what would you charge and then eventually they'll choose who to hire and this illustrates that free software means there's a free market for support of all kinds support for proprietary software is usually a monopoly because only the developer has the source code so only the developer can change anything if the user wants a change and the developer doesn't do it the user has to beg please oh developer make this change for me sometimes the developer says pay us and we'll listen to your problem and if the user does that the developer says thank you in six months there will be an upgrade buy the upgrade and you'll see if we fixed your problem and you'll see what new problems we have in store for you <laughs> but with free software anyone who has a copy can study the source code master it and begin offering support so we have a free market for support and therefore those organizations that really value good support and are willing to pay for it because you're always going to have to pay for good support unless the public really loves you they can generally get better support through the free market for f support for free software that is better support for their money because they're not stuck with one monopoly for support now this brings us to a paradox usually when there's a choice between products to do a job we say that that's there's no monopoly but when there's a choice between proprietary software packages yes there is monopoly there's more than one monopoly if the poor user chooses this program then he's stuck with this monopoly for support but if the poor user chooses this program he's stuck with this monopoly for support so it's a choice between monopolies there's no way to escape from monopoly except free software it's the only way to escape from monopoly and this illustrates a broader principle freedom is something much bigger than the freedom to than having a choice between a few fixed options so because freedom means having control of your own life so when people try to analyze the meaning of freedom by equating it to the freedom of choice they've already thrown away most of what freedom means they're keeping just a little piece of it so their analysis will tend 
to show that freedom is a pretty unimportant small thing. Because they've thrown away most of it. Be on the lookout for that error. Having a choice between proprietary programs means being able to choose your master. Freedom is not having a master. So I've explained the reasons for the four essential freedoms, why each of these freedoms is essential. If a program gives you all four of these freedoms, then it's free software. That means it is being distributed to the public in a system that is ethical, that respects people's freedom and respects social solidarity. If one of these freedoms is missing, then the system of distribution of the program is antisocial, and it shouldn't be distributed that way. The development of a proprietary program is not a contribution to society, it's an attack. So I reached the conclusion in 1983 that I wanted to use software in freedom. And I had reached more or less these ideas, not every aspect, of course, but the basic part of it. And so I wondered, how could I possibly do that? I wanted to have freedom, and I wanted to enable other people to have freedom. But that, there was no easy way to know. It wasn't clear how you could do that at all. Because in 1983, all the operating systems for modern computers were proprietary. And the computer won't do anything without an operating system. And that meant that if you wanted to get a computer and use it, the second step after buying the computer was to sign a license, a non-disclosure agreement, to get an executable copy of the operating system. So just to get the binaries, you had to promise not to share with anyone and thus betray your whole community. And the source code was essentially unavailable to ordinary users. So. It was impossible to use a computer in freedom in a community. What could I do about that? I was one man with no particular fame except in this narrow field of editor development. And I knew that most people didn't agree with this position. So I didn't think I had much chance of starting a mass movement that would convince governments to change their laws or convince companies to change their business practices. But there was another way I could proceed. Instead of convincing anybody to make the existing operating systems free, I could write another one. And that way, I wouldn't have to convince anybody in particular I just had to write code. And that was my strong point. Operating system development was my field. So I realized I could solve, or at least possibly I could solve a social problem by doing technical work. At this point, I realized that here was a major social problem that I was aware of but that most people had not recognized. I had the skills necessary to try to solve this problem, and probably nobody else would do it if I did not. Therefore, I had been elected by circumstances to do this job. It's as if you see someone drowning, and you know how to swim, and it's not Bush or Il Ducino,
You know who Il Duccino is? His name is Berlusconi. then you have a moral duty to save that person. Now, I don't know how to swim, but in this case, the job that had to be done was not swimming, it was writing lots of code, and that I could do. So I decided I would develop a free operating system or die trying, presumably of old age. Because at the time, the free software movement, which I was just launching, had no active enemies. Lots of people disagreed with us, but they didn't actively try to stop us. They just laughed and said, we'll, you'll never make a complete free operating system, ha ha. <laughs> and I didn't know if they were right or wrong. Nobody knew at the time if we would ever have a complete free operating system. But I decided to try anyway, because when you're fighting for freedom, you can't afford to wait until it's a sure thing. If you wait until it's a sure thing, you lose most of the opportunities, and, and you've got no hope at all. You have to try when you don't know if you're going to win. <clears throat> this decision to develop a free software operating system led to other decisions, technical design decisions. What kind of system should it be? Back in the 1980s, there were many different computer architectures. And every year or two, there was a new one. I realized it would take years to finish an operating system and during that time, the computer architectures could change. Therefore, if I didn't want the system to be obsolete before it was finished, it had to be portable. But there was only one successful portable operating system that I knew of. It was Unix. It was not free software, so we couldn't use it ethically. But it did provide a model of how you could make an operating system portable. So I decided to follow the design of Unix and that way have a better chance of making a portable system that would really work. Further, since Unix was popular, especially in academia, I decided to make this system upward compatible with Unix. That way, all the people who already used Unix could easily switch. However, that decision had an interesting consequence because Unix consists of many hundreds of components that communicate through interfaces that were more or less documented. And the users use the same interfaces. So, in order to be compatible with Unix, that means keeping the same interfaces, which means replacing each component one by one. Therefore, all the initial design decisions had been made. We could just look for people to replace each component of Unix independently. Therefore, the only thing that we needed in order to start the project was a name. In the community of programmers who shared our soft we shared our software in the 1970s, where I learned that free software was a good way of life, we programmed mainly for joy. Some of us were students and the rest mostly were employees, but that was all a side issue. The real reason for our programming was joy. And so we often gave our programs funny names or even mischievous names. 
because thinking of the users laughing at the name of the program is half the fun. And we had a specific tradition that when you are writing a program which is similar to or compatible with some existing program, you can give your program a name which is a recursive acronym that says that this program is not the other one. For instance, in 1975, as part of that community, I developed the first Emacs text editor. It's an extensible programmable text editor. You can reprogram the editor during the editing session. And people liked it so much that there were 30 imitations of Emacs, and many of them were called something Emacs. But some, the ones that were done by hackers usually, were called, one was called fine, for fine is not Emacs. And then there was sign, for sign is not Emacs. And then there was Ina for Ina is not Emacs. And there was Mince for Mince is not complete Emacs. And version two of Ina was called Zwei for Zwei was Ina initially. So you can have a lot of fun with recursive acronyms. So I look for a recursive acronym for something is not Unix. But when I tried the usual four letter method, I saw that none of the combinations was a word, at least not in English. And if it doesn't have another meaning, it's not a joke. So what could I do? Well, I thought I could make a contraction. And then I'd get a three letter recursive acronym. So I tried every possible letter, Anu, Bnu, Knu, Dnu, Inu, Fnu, Gnu. But Gnu is the funniest word in the English language. It's used for lots of wordplay. And the reason is because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced Nu. So anytime you were going to say Nu, you could Say you could write GNU and pronounce it GNU instead, and you've got a joke. Many, many years ago, some people occasionally said, hey, what's GNU? And now there's a better answer. You can answer them, GNU is not Unix. And the best part is, it sounds like you are being evasive. It sounds like you're refusing to tell the person what it is and you're only telling him what it's not. But in fact, you're giving the exact correct answer. It only sounds like you're being evasive. So, uh, and, and there was even a funny song based on the word GNU when I was a child. So, given a specific, meaningful reason to call a particular thing GNU, I couldn't resist. And this illustrates the hacker spirit. What does it mean to be a hacker? It means to enjoy playful cleverness. And this is not just with computers, and it's in any area of life. You could be playfully clever. If, if you enjoy that and you like to do that, then you're a hacker. And whenever you do that, it's hacking. So this name was an example of a typical part of the hacker spirit, which we call ha-ha only serious, which is here I was starting the most important thing I would ever do in my life. I knew that if it succeeded, it would be the most important thing I'd ever do in my life. But that didn't mean we can't make jokes. So I gave it a name, which is a joke. <clears throat> However, when it's the name of our operating system, please do not follow the dictionary. If you pronounce it new, you will get people very confused. You see, we've been working on it for 22 years now, so it's not new anymore. But it still is and always will be GNU, 
regardless of the people who pronounce it erroneously, Linux. So how did that confusion get started? How did it happen that there are tens of millions of people using the GNU system and they think they're using Linux? Well, during the 1980s, our task was to develop all these pieces we needed for a Unix-like operating system. Lots of components were needed. I say we because from the very beginning, it was my intention to recruit other people to join in. The goal was not to have an operating system written entirely by me. The goal was to have a free operating system as soon as possible. And everything I, I planned was to help us get there as soon as possible. So I recruited other people. Do you want to write some piece of the system? So various people started writing various components. And for the big components, the ones that seemed like they would be hard, I tried to find shortcuts. So I tried to see if somebody else had written a program that we could manage to use, perhaps changing it. Maybe the existing free program would be just a starting point or just part of it. But still, that helps. That helps you get it done sooner. <clears throat> so I did that with all of the major components. And sometimes I found something and sometimes I didn't. By 1990, we had all of the essential components and many others except one. One of the major essential components, the kernel, was still missing. And in 1990, I found a starting point. I found a program called Mach, which people refer to as a microkernel, meaning it does, if you look at the kernel's job, Mach does the bottom half. And the idea is on top of that, you write specific programs to provide the specific kernel services that you want. And they run in user space, which means it's easier to debug them. So I thought, well, half the job has been done for us. We just have to write the other half in user space. So this way, we'll get our kernel done really soon. And this architecture of a microkernel plus multiple servers is also what people thought at the time was, the, was the, the advanced best way to write a kernel. It turns out that that design has some problems. And uh, it took many years to get our kernel to run at all. And it still doesn't run well enough that we could recommend it to you to use. Fortunately, we didn't have to wait for that. Because in 1991, a college student in Finland developed his own kernel. He used the old-fashioned monolithic design, and he got it to barely work in less than a year. This kernel, which he called Linux, initially was not free software. In 1992, he liberated it by changing the license. He adopted the GNU General Public License, which is the license that I had written for use in the components of GNU. Now, the GNU General Public License, or GNU GPL for short, is not the only free software license. There are many other free software licenses. But it's the most popular one. It's used for about 70% of all free software projects. And it's special in that it is a copyleft license. Cop you see, all free software licenses give you the four freedoms. That's what makes it a free software license. If it, if it gives you the four freedoms, then it's a free software license. But, when, but in regard to freedom number three, there's a choice. It has to permit you to distribute modified versions. The question is, can you make those modified versions proprietary? Some licenses permit that. Copyleft 
is the requirement that says when you distribute a modified version, it must have the same license. In other words, the modified versions must be free as well. So copyleft is a way of utilizing copyright law, but instead of using it to subjugate people, we use it to protect everyone's freedom. <clears throat> so the idea is <clears throat> we make sure that by, when the program reaches you, you get the four freedoms, and the way we do that is we say the middleman is forbidden to remove the freedoms before the program reaches you. There are also free software licenses which are not copyleft, and they do permit proprietary modified versions. So there, in those, those licenses do not, they recognize everyone's freedom, but with copyleft we go even further and we actively defend everybody's freedom. In any case, when Linux had switched to a free software license, the result was that it was possible to use Linux to fill the last gap in the GNU system. And the result was a complete free operating system, which was basically GNU with Linux added. The development of Linux, the kernel, was an important contribution to the free software community because that was the step that carried us across the finish line. Before that, we had lots of good free programs and there were many who used them. But in order to use them, they had to install them on top of some other non-free operating system. After the last step had been taken, we had a complete free operating system and it was possible to install that in a bare PC. And thus, the goal we had set out for eight years before had been reached. It was possible for the first time to get a PC and use it in freedom as part of a community. So Linux itself was an important contribution to our community. But the confusion of thinking that this entire combination was Linux was a big blow to the free software movement because it broke the connection from our software to our philosophy. Before that, there were many people who installed specific GNU components and they knew they were installing GNU components. So when they saw the articles that described our philosophy, the same philosophy I've been telling you today, they would see, they would see them and say, ah, this is the philosophy behind those programs I like so much. So they would read it and pay attention. This doesn't mean that they all agreed with us, but at least we had a chance to convince them. And if they did agree with us, that with our philosophy, then they would feel motivated to develop more free software. So the software spread the philosophy and the philosophy helped extend the software. But once millions of people started using essentially a variant of the GNU system with Linux as the kernel and thinking that the whole thing was Linux, then it didn't lead them to our philosophy anymore. Instead, it led them to look for moral guidance to the developer of Linux because they, they were told, ah, here you have the Linux system. And so they thought of themselves as Linux users and they heard that he was the author of Linux. So they thought that the whole thing came from his vision. And what was the vision he told them? He said, I just did this to have fun. I don't want to think about politics. Uh, all software licenses are okay and you have to obey them no matter what they say. And then he was developing proprietary software in his work and he said so. And then he was using a non-free program to develop Linux publicly. And so it, it was, he, he very visibly disagrees 
with the philosophy of the free software movement and always has. Well, he has a right to his views. What I don't like is when people attribute our work that was based on our campaign for freedom to him and think that it's an advertisement for his views. And that's why I ask you, please call the system GNU plus Linux or GNU slash Linux. Because when the people think they're Linux users, and they see the articles about the philosophy of GNU, they say, that has nothing to do with me, I'm a Linux user. They tend to ignore us. Now, if you want to explain the philosophy of the free software movement to other people, that can be a very useful thing to do, especially once you learn to do a good job of it. But that takes time. And you may not want to spend all your time explaining this. But it only takes one second to say GNU slash in front of Linux. So if you were going to mention the system 20 times a day, it'll take you 20 seconds a day to say GNU slash each time. Now, it's true that this doesn't explain the philosophy to people. You can't explain the philosophy in one second or even in 20 seconds. But you can prepare other people so that when they see our explanation, they will pay more attention. And that's what you do when you call the system GNU slash Linux. It's not just a matter of giving the GNU developers the credit that we deserve, although we do deserve it. It's more important than that. It's the easiest most time efficient way that you can spread awareness of these issues of freedom among the others who use or have heard of the system that we developed for the sake of freedom. The GNU system is the only operating system that was developed specifically for the sake of freedom and community. Other operating systems were developed for technical or commercial reasons. <clears throat> this is the one operating system developed for the sake of freedom. And people are in danger. E e and this fact is being forgotten even by its own users. You see, <clears throat> history tells us that freedom does not persist automatically. Freedom is always in danger of being lost. And if people want to continue to have freedom, they must be prepared to defend it. And defending freedom is often not easy. But in order to defend freedom, people have to value freedom. And in order to value freedom, people have to know what it is. In other areas of life, at least that part's taken care of. It's not easy to defend freedom of the press in Italy or the US. But at least people know what it is. A couple of months ago, we saw freedom of the press threatened around the world. First, <clears throat> some newspapers published cartoons making fun of Muhammad in a rather mild way, and we saw a bunch of fanatics try to punish whole countries for allowing that freedom of the press. And then we saw a Turkish movie which depicts the United States as a, an evil conquering power that tortures people, which would be a nasty thing to say if it weren't the truth. And then we saw the entire country of Turkey being condemned for the fact that it had, uh, had the freedom of speech to, necessary to make this movie. So, 
freedom of speech was getting it from both sides. Teaching people to really respect freedom of speech, which means that anybody can be criticized, any view can be criticized, no view is so sacred that it can't be made fun of, is often hard. But at least people know the idea of freedom of speech and freedom of the press because speech and the press have existed for a long time and these ideas have been promoted for centuries. But computing is new. It's just 10 years, I think, since a lot of people in Italy began using computers. And the process of identifying the freedoms that go with the use of computers is just beginning. The free software movement says, here are four essential human rights that every user of software deserves to have. But most people, even most users of the GNU plus Linux system, have never heard this. So we haven't even got to the first level where people know what freedom is. How are we going to defend it? This is the area where our community needs the most work. You see, during the 90s, as the GNU plus Linux system became popular, many, many techies discovered that it was powerful and reliable and of course, you could get it cheap because anybody with a copy could give you a copy. So they, they started telling other people, here's this powerful, reliable operating system, and it's very cheap to run, and it's cool. And they didn't say it respects your freedom to cooperate. They left that out. And when I pointed this out to people, they would often say, well, let's follow a two-stage approach. First, let's convince people to use the system, and then we can teach them to appreciate the freedom. Well, maybe this approach would work if we really tried it. But when the people said that to me, it was always an excuse to work on stage one and ignore stage two. And the result is we got this big community in which just a few of us had ever heard the idea of freedom. So the result is nowadays when somebody joins the community, he's probably surrounded by other people who never talk about freedom. They probably never hear the idea that non-free software is antisocial, that it's an evil, that it shouldn't happen, it shouldn't exist. The most basic idea, the reason why we've all, why this whole thing exists is forgotten by most of our community. So if you think that two-stage approach is a good one, please join me in working on stage two. We have all these people using the system. We have to teach them now to recognize why it's important. Because today, our community has something that we didn't have before. Enemies, powerful, rich enemies, and the governments that serve them. Microsoft has announced its intention to try to impede our work. Other companies have not said this, but they're doing it anyway. <clears throat> For instance, the United States has two different laws that prohibit various kinds of free software, and it's considering others. One of these laws is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is not really a copyright law. It's really a technology control law. And what this law says is that if some if there are technical obstacles to accessing certain data or communicating with certain software, then anything that solves the problem is prohibited. 
in effect, it gives the publishers the power to write their own copyright regulations. They just implement those restrictions, whatever restrictions they want, as DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, in some software. They say, this is the only authorized software. And then whatever software we write to access the same data is illegal. Because you see, if it's free software, people can use it to get around the restrictions because people are free to change it. If you were in the United States, and I hope that you're not going to be in the United States because as a foreigner in the United States, you could be subject to arbitrary imprisonment even legally. <clears throat> One of the few rights you would nominally still have is that if you buy a DVD, you have the right to watch it. But the free software you could use to watch it on your free GNU slash Linux system is illegal. It has been censored. The United States practices censorship of software. And I'm sad to say it's illegal in most of Europe as well because the European Union adopted a directive which is fairly similar. The directive only says that commercial distribution is prohibited. But most countries, when they implemented the directive, they, went, they made it nastier than was required and they prohibited this completely. However, that is something that you could conceivably change. You can organize to, for the legalization of the non-commercial distribution of DECSS and similar software. <clears throat> what should be illegal is DRM itself. Another law in the United States that prohibits various kinds of free software is patent law. You see, in the US, any kind of computational idea can be patented. A feature can be patented. An algorithm can be patented. A, a computational technique can be patented. Some aspect of the design of a data structure or a file format can be patented. Well, if you look at a large program, it combines thousands of such ideas. If 10% of the ideas are patented, that means the large program infringes hundreds of patents at once, meaning the developer and the users of the program are facing the risk of hundreds of different lawsuits. This is a crazy system because it subjects all software developers to a threat and all software users as well. But this is the kind of crazy thing that the US does. And you know, when there's a problem in the United States, the United States doesn't try to fix it. Instead, it tries to impose the same problem on the rest of the world. And that's what it's doing. The United States government along with the mega corporations it obeys, are trying to impose software patents elsewhere in the world, and that includes the European Union. Last July, one attempt was defeated in the European Parliament. They're already planning the next attempt. You are going to have to organize, you're going to have to contribute your time to the campaign against software patents. Take a look at the site FFII.org, which is the principal site of opposition to software patents in the European Union. Join in their campaign. Your help is needed. So today, with these powerful enemies, it's no longer just a matter of developing more software for people to use. Yes, we have to do that. But we also have to organize politically 
to, so that we are still permitted to develop more software for people to use. 20 years ago, the question was, were we capable of developing a broad spectrum of free software, of satisfying the public's needs? Today, we have answered that question. The remaining question is, will, <clears throat> will non-democratic governments allow us to continue serving the public? <clears throat> and we also face a threat from inside our computers. There is a conspiracy to redesign the computers of the future, to redesign them so that we can't do, so that we can't really program them to do what we want. The thing that makes computers so useful is that they are general purpose computers. They are universal machines. They can be programmed to do any computation. That's exactly what this conspiracy aims to change. The idea is to arrange that there are jobs we can't program them to do, but they can't be programmed to do by us, so that they will not be real general purpose computers anymore. We call this treacherous computing. The perpetrators, the conspirators, call it trusted computing. And this is a difference of point of view. You see, they want to design the computers so that application developers can trust your computer to obey them and disobey you. From their point of view, it's trusted. From your point of view, it's treacherous. So by choosing the term, you choose whose side you're on. <clears throat> the companies in this conspiracy include Intel, AMD, IBM, Apple, HP, uh, Microsoft, and uh, I think the Hollywood as well. Now, treacherous computing would mean that DRM is not just illegal to escape from, it's impossible to escape from. <clears throat> and that's the goal of what they're doing. <clears throat> and by the way, when I say that these companies are involved in this conspiracy, this is not a conspiracy theory. I'm not guessing. They have a website, they say so. This is a, an admitted conspiracy. It should be illegal anyway. Companies should not be allowed to make conspiracies like this to control future technology. This should be a crime. This conspiracy should be broken up. <clears throat> Thus, the future of our community depends on what we value, above all. There is nothing more important for us to do than teach other people to recognize the four freedoms and value them and defend them. If we gave everybody, if we could magically make free software to do every job and give it to people tomorrow, tomorrow they would have freedom. Would they still have freedom five years from now? Not necessarily, because if they don't appreciate their freedom, they'll let it slip. Someone will say, here's a nice program that does a certain job better. All you have to do to get this program is promise not to share with everyone else. And these people who don't appreciate freedom and don't recognize it's important, why would they say no? So five years from now, they might not have freedom anymore. Two years ago, when people asked me, which distribution of GNU plus Linux do you recommend? There was none. I, there was no distribution I knew of. That, no, 
I didn't know of any general purpose distribution that was entirely free software. You see, 10 years ago, it became normal for those who make the distributions to include some non-free software as well. And they always said to the public, as a bonus, we also give you this thing. Maybe it was Netscape or some other non-free program. And of course, when some distributors did this, the others were at a disadvantage because the public was saying to them, why don't you, the other distribution is better because it has Netscape. And so the other distributors started adding it too and it reached a point where there was essentially no place I could send people. Now, I do know of a few entirely free distributions. The general purpose ones I know of include Ututo, Agnula, and Blag, and they are listed in the GNU Project's website, www.gnu.org. So, <clears throat> we're making some headway on that, on that problem. But this shows you just how bad the bigger problem has become, the bigger problem that the people in our community don't even think about freedom. And if we don't start thinking about it more, we're going to lose it. I want to treat a few secondary themes. One secondary theme is free software and employment. If the world gets rid of proprietary software and switches to free software, how will this affect IT sector employment? Well, the first thing to realize is that there are, there are unemployed programmers today, and there will probably be unemployed programmers in the future, probably even more of them. That's just life. No matter what happens, free software or proprietary, there will be unemployed programmers. But will there be more of them? Let's look at the IT sector. Programming is just a fraction of the IT sector. The, un the people who can't get programming jobs can get other kinds of IT jobs. So in this fraction, a small fraction of that is proprietary software development, maybe 10%. The rest is development of special purpose custom software for a particular client to use. So, and that's not going to change. If the world insists on free software, the clients who want special purpose software will still have to pay someone to write it. So the jobs were, that we might, that might go away are, is a small fraction of a small fraction of the IT sector. In other words, it's no disaster. It doesn't really change the situation much. But we may not lose jobs at all. We might gain jobs. You see, free software also creates other jobs, jobs adapting and extending free software. When a business thinks of using a proprietary program, it has two options, take it or leave it, use it or don't. With a free program, those two options are there, but so are many others. Make this small change, or this small change, or this small change, or this medium change, or this one, or this one, or this big change, or this big change. Almost an infinity of different changes they might want to make. And often they will make some changes. And this means paying programmers. So some jobs would disappear, and some jobs would appear. And whether we, this will result in a decrease or an increase, I don't know. What I can be sure of is it will not result in a disaster for IT sector employment. You don't have to worry. The second secondary topic is free software and education. Schools must use exclusively free software. There are four reasons for this. The most superficial reason is to save money. In every, in every country, the school, no matter how rich it is, the schools are limited by their budget. 
So they should not be spending their some of this limited money getting permission to use non-free software. However, some proprietary software companies get rid of this reason by donating gratis copies of their non-free software to the school. This is part of the reason why you should always use the Italian word libero. Don't say free software when you're speaking Italian. Say software libero. It'll be clearer because we're not talking about software gratuito. We're talking about software libero. <clears throat> so soon I hope it wasn't something I said <clears throat> and why do those companies do that is it because they are idealistic and want to help education no the reason is they want to turn these schools into instruments of imposing their power on all of society. When schools choose between proprietary software and free software, they direct society down one path or another. If the schools teach proprietary software, they are inculcating dependency into their students, a dependency that will last after they graduate. And you can be sure that the same companies that give these students gratis copies today will not give those same people gratis copies after they graduate, nor will it give gratis copies to their employers. So really, this is a way of using the school to apply leverage to society as a whole. Schools, however, have a social mission they're supposed to train a society of capable people accustomed to freedom. And this means teaching the use of free software and only free software. Schools have a mission to train the next generation so that it will be accustomed to living in freedom. <clears throat> But there is a deeper reason. For the sake of programming education, you see, at the age of 14 or so, some people, the natural-born programmers, become fascinated with computers and want to learn everything about them. If a student is using a program, he wants to know how it works. But when he asks a teacher, if the program is, how does this program work? If the program is proprietary, the teacher has to say, I'm sorry, I don't know, and you can't know because it's a secret. And thus education is not possible. But if the program is free software, the teacher can say, here's what I know, and if you want to learn more, here's the source code. Read it, and you'll learn everything. And the student will read it because he's fascinated. And the teacher can say, if you find any part that you don't understand, show it to me, I'll figure it out and explain it to you. And this way the student learns a very important thing, how not to write code. Because these students don't have to learn to program. For them, it's obvious. You read a manual, you know what to do. But learning to write clear code that other people can understand, that takes time. The way you learn to write good, clear code is by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. And every time you read something which is hard to understand, you learn something. Don't write it that way.
Thus, every school in Italy can offer people the opportunity to learn to perfect their programming skills just by having a PC running GNU slash Linux and at least one teacher capable of guiding these students as they wish to learn. But there is an even deeper reason for moral education. You see, schools have a mission to teach children the habit of cooperation, the habit, and thus eventually the spirit of goodwill of helping your neighbor. So every class has to have a rule. Children, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share it with the other kids in the class. And if you won't share it, you can't bring it. However, the school has to set an example of its own rule. The school must bring only free software to class. Therefore, I suggest that you begin organizing to begin the long path of moving this university completely to free software. This can't get done in a day. It will take time, it will take multiple steps. But if you stand firm for recognition of the social mission of a university, which is to encourage the dissemination of knowledge, then right will always be on your side. <clears throat> so now I will close by introducing my other identity. See, sometimes people have accused me saying that I had a holier-than-thou attitude. I don't think that's true, because when I meet someone who is not doing everything possible to struggle for free software, I don't seek to criticize that person. What I, do, what I want to do is convince that person to do more. However, I do have a holy attitude because I'm a saint, it's my job to be holy. I am Saint Ignatius <laughs> of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. <laughs> Emacs started out as a text editor, but because it was extensible, it was extended to do everything. And it became a way of life for many users as they discovered they could do all their work without ever exiting from Emacs. And ultimately, with the creation of the news group alt.religion.emacs, it became a religion as well. <laughs> Today in the Church of Emacs, we have a great schism between two rival versions of Emacs. And we also have saints. Fortunately, no gods. Instead of gods, we worship an editor. <laughs> to be a member of the Church of Emacs, you must recite the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, <laughs> and Linux <laughs> is not finished, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> the 
The Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with some other churches I won't name. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. So if you've been searching for a church to be holy in, you might want to consider ours. However, it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever proprietary operating systems possess any of the computers under your control and then install a wholly free operating system and then only install free software on top of that. If you make this vow and you live by it, then you too will be a saint and you too may eventually have a halo if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. Sometimes people ask me whether it is a sin in the Church of Emacs to use the other text editor VI. <laughs> it's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast, <laughs> but using a free version of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. And sometimes people ask me whether my halo is really an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo. <laughs> but it was a computer disk in a previous existence. So thank you. Richard, lo ringraziamo anche per la benedizione della chiesa di Ima. E le domande? Adesso voglio può rispondere a qualche domanda. C'era un foglietto che girava per raccogliere delle domande. Ah, uh, here first of all, can someone call the place I'm staying and see if a FedEx package has arrived? Ah, yeah. And if it has, someone could bring it right over. Actually, I have the FedEx tracking information. Oh, is that copies of the information? Uh, no. No. Oh, th this questions. is questions. Anyway, if someone could call now and find out, we could bring it over here before everyone's gone. That could be very useful. For instance, I ran out of stickers to give out, but this package has stickers. So if, yeah. <clears throat> And in fact, I have the tracking information, so if it's, in the, if it's in the city now, we could contact FedEx and try to get it brought over here. Yeah, we have to turn the computer on. I'll, I'll get to the question. Uh, 
I've been asked about the GNU herd. That's the, that's the upper half of the GNU kernel. Remember, the bottom half is Mach, and the upper half, we gave that the name of the GNU herd, because GNUs in Africa live in herds. This is a herd of GNU servers. Well, as I said, it's, it's not working well enough, and part of, it looks like we need to switch to a different microkernel in order to fix these problems which means substantial rewriting. So if you're interested in kernels and you want to help us and you're prepared to do a lot of work, then write to the herd developers and offer to help. It's not useful to help in small ways, not at this stage. Next question. What do you think? What do you think about the patents on uh, vegetable on OG and the Oh, well, I'm against uh, patenting agricultural plants or animals because farmers have a right to save their seeds. Who pays the high costs to the who pays the high cost to the very high price of your, your high price of idea of open source? Open source is not what I do. Uh, open source is the term used by people who want to talk about free software and forget the ethical issues. When you hear somebody saying open source, you can probably expect that person to focus solely on values such as making software powerful or reliable and not to talk about freedom to cooperate in a community. Therefore, I don't use that term. I work for Software Libero. <clears throat> now, whoever wrote that question is apparently unfriendly because he talks about a high cost. In fact, lots of free software is developed by volunteers, and the only cost is the time that the volunteers spend. And as long as we're not complaining, why should he complain for us? On the other hand, there are also many important free programs that are developed commercially. This is free commercial software. Some people make the mistake of thinking that free software and commercial software are opposites, but that's not true. Many free programs are commercial, and some business is paying people to develop them. What precisely is happening, I don't know. You know, but many, you know, IBM does this, lots of small companies do this. In the case of the small companies, most of the time, the clients are paying the company to set up systems for them. Please, we want a system to do this, this, and this. And the company says, well, we have some free software that does 90% of it, but you'll have to pay us to, to make it do the other 10%. And that's the cheapest way to get it done. So they say, the client says yes. Do you believe it right to extend all the freedoms that the GPL license to other arts, such as music and uh, movies? Well, first I should point out that the GPL is not the only free software license, and all free software licenses give you the four freedoms in one way or another. But now turning to the point of the question, should art all be free? I don't think that art must be free. You see, software is an example of a practical work, a work of practical use. When you use a work to do a job in your life, having freedom to live your life the way you wish requires that you have freedom to use the work, which means the four freedoms, and thus works of practical use must be free. However, art is not a work of practical use. That's not the way art contributes to society. It, it makes a different kind of contribution. I believe that everyone should have the freedom 
in, in, in regard to published works of art, everyone should have the freedom to make exact copies and distribute them non-commercially. Thus, for instance, internet sharing. But that's as far as I will say is necessary. I won't say that all art must be free, meaning the four freedoms that are the definition of free. However, I think copyright on art should only last uh, 10 years or so. And after that, other artists will be free to make derivative art and thus contribute to the progress of art. Okay. Do you believe that the Creative Commons license is a good result on the road towards this? Ah, this is a terrible error to speak of the Creative Commons license. I don't know if that, did he use singular and, yeah. That's a terrible error. You see, Creative Commons recommends something like 10 or 15 licenses. And what they have in common is nothing. If you look at the various Creative Commons licenses and see what freedom do they have in common, the answer is zero. In fact, there are some Creative Commons licenses which give all of you no freedom at all because they only give some freedom to people in developing countries and Italy is not considered a developing country. So because of this, I do not support Creative Commons. Some of their licenses are okay for various purposes. Considered in, in, on, in and of themselves, whereas other Creative Commons licenses should not be used at all for anything. But people have a tendency to, to lump them all together. It was just, just a week ago a speaker said that certain information was released under, a create, under the Creative Commons license. You know, this, the term Creative Commons is a motor for this confusion. It's not an accident. The, you, one of you was confused because the confusion is all around. And because of that, I can't support Creative Commons at all. Creative Commons focuses its publicity on promoting the name Creative Commons. So it's a natural tendency. It, it's, it's, this leads to people's ignoring the details. So I do not join in promoting the name Creative Commons. I ask them to divest themselves of the unacceptable licenses. But they, didn't, they decided not to do that. What do you, what's your opinion on the BSD license? Uh, there is no such thing as the BSD license. There were at least two different BSD licenses. Both of them are free software licenses. One of them is compatible with the GNU GPL. The other is incompatible with the GNU GPL. So it's very important not to confuse them. Please don't ever talk about the BSD license. There is the original BSD license with the obnoxious BSD advertising clause and there is the revised BSD license which does not have that advertising clause. So it makes a big difference. Uh, but they're both free software licenses so both of them are basically ethically legitimate. And uh, also, what is your opinion on the Palladium project? Well, well, Palladium is Microsoft's original name for its version of treacherous computing. And all treacherous computing is an attack on your freedom. And it should be illegal. What is your opinion on the decision of Linus Torvald on uh, not to use the GPL version 3? Well, it isn't a final decision. He's changed his mind to some extent from time to time. I hope that Linux will use GPL version 3 
because GPL version 3 protects against TiVoization. It protects against schemes that deny the users the practical use of freedom number one, the freedom to change the software to do what you want. Here's what the TiVo does. The TiVo contains a GNU slash Linux system, which means there are various parts that are under the GNU GPL. And they comply with the GNU GPL. They'll, they will give you the source code. And you get the source code under the GNU GPL. So it says you can modify it. You can. You, you can compile your modified version. You can install it in the TiVo. And then the TiVo will not run at all. Because it's designed only to run the authorized version. If, there, if the code install, installed in the TiVo is not the authorized version, it doesn't run. So this means that freedom number one exists in a formal sense, but it does not really exist in a practical sense. And that is what the controversial part of GPL version 3 is designed to prevent. GPL version 3 says, they not only have to say you're formally permitted to make modified versions, they must give you whatever it takes so that your modified version will really run. Thus, freedom one must be practically real, not just a legal formality. I hope that Linux will use GPL version 3 so that the user's freedom in using Linux will be protected in this way. What's your opinion on the sponsorization of uh, big companies for free software? On the whatization? Well, big corporations I'm sorry. sponsoring. Them. Oh, sp okay. Sponsorization is not an English word, but. Uh, and I didn't hear. I had trouble hearing it because of that. Anyway, but now I know what you meant. Uh, anybody's welcome to support the development of free software. Everybody's welcome to distribute free software. We're not going to say that just because a big company is doing something that makes it wrong. We judge every action by its nature. So. I'm happy with the help that the companies have sometimes given us. However, you have to recognize that it's, it's inconsistent help. Uh, there's no big company which is uh, fully supporting the free software world. They do it sometimes, and other times they develop proprietary software. Do you enjoy Italian cooking? Usually, yes. Do you know a good software platform for virtual assembly? I don't know what virtual assembly means. But you know, there are, in the free software directory, which is in directory.fsf.org, there are over, there are almost 4,600 packages listed. I don't know them all. I've never heard of most of them. So, if you want to find free software for a specific job, first look in the free software directory. Then there are other places you can also look. You can do searches. You might find something. But don't expect me to know it. How can a small software company survive developing free software? Well, the way they do it, as I said, is by being paid to extend the software as part of setting up systems for particular clients. Opinion. Will it be possible to purchase uh, non-DRM computers in the future? I don't know. But, well, it, they're talking about making a version of the $100 laptop for general purchase. And if they do that, I think that'll be one. And, uh, an oh, but although I should point out 
DRM can be programmed into software to run on any computer. Any non-free program could have DRM. So the thing that distinguishes different types of computers is whether they have treacherous computing. So the real question is, will there be a non-treacherous computer available in the future? On the question of operating systems, since the operating system is not only a kernel, where does the kernel and where does the accessory software begin? Well, it's a mistake to say that the rest of the operating system is accessories. Other parts of the system are just as essential as the kernel is. And you can see in the code, here's the kernel, here's the C library, here are all the other programs like the command interpreter and the compiler, and you'll see what job each program does. Generally, the other programs don't talk directly to the kernel. They talk to the C library, which is the GNU C library, and that talks to the kernel. Should the GNU software include other software releases also, like from BSD? Well, there's a difference between the GNU operating system and GNU software. GNU software means programs that people have explicitly contributed to the GNU project or developed under the auspices of the GNU project. So there's a specific list of GNU programs, several hundred of them, and anything else is not a GNU program. That's not a criticism. If you make a free program, what you're doing is ethical and it could be a great contribution to the community, but it's not our contribution, it's your contribution. The GNU system includes many programs which are not GNU programs, and it always has, because our goal was to make a complete free operating system. Whenever somebody else wrote a useful free program, we could include it, but we had to develop all the rest. So back in 1991, the GNU software was probably something like 50% of the whole system, and the rest was software like X11 and Linux and Tech and BSD programs and from various other places that had not... It had been developed for other purposes, but it was free, and so we could use it. Do you think your GPL is extensible also to more industrial matters, such as mechanical parts? No, because the GNU GPL is based on copyright law, and mechanical parts are not copyrightable. Thank you. Qualcuno ha qualche domanda? Do you think that GNU would have the same success if HERD didn't have that part in it, basically? HERD. Yeah, if HERD was more important. Well, if the GNU HERD had worked well, as we hoped it would, I think things would have gone more or less the same. But how can we know, after all? It's just a guess. We're talking about an imaginary world. No, they were asking if you had chosen HERD instead of Linux, basically, Linux. But the GNU HERD doesn't work. So that's why we don't use it. 
I mean, people who run the GNU system run it with Linux. Sometimes we say, when, when people are using the GNU system with the herd as a kernel, sometimes we call that a GNU slash herd system to help make the contrast between that and the GNU slash Linux system. But in fact, the GNU slash herd system is GNU because the herd is the GNU kernel. I think we spent enough time on this semantic detail. So if you could take another question, please. They would like to know your opinion on the war in Iraq and the Bush government. Well, Bush is a war criminal, and he should... <laughs> Bush should spend the rest of his life in prison for his crimes, and he should have Saddam Hussein as a cellmate. Or you, or speak into the microphone. They're asking what your uh, the opinion out of Italy of Italy. I don't have an opinion of Italy because yeah, they're the of the thing. I've been in Italy several times and I've met different people and seen different places and eaten different foods and I have an opinion about various different things, but. I don't add that up into an opinion about Italy. The what? What's the what? The press. The press. The papers. Oh, I don't know. software's foundation um, relationship with the various governments that it comes into contact with? Well, we don't have much in the way of relationships with governments directly. Uh, some governments have policies in favor of free software, and some of them have talked with me about it. But some, in some cases, they've, they haven't talked with me or anyone from the FSF, and they've done it consulting local people. So we don't have much in the way of, re of relationship with governments. However, FSF Europe has a pretty good relationship with the people who are prosecuting Microsoft in the European Union. So uh, that has been useful. Oh, I wanted to say one thing about my opinion of Italy. One aspect of Italy is a very shameful one, and that is Italian embassies around the world are very nasty, are cruel, vicious to people who are trying to get visas. In fact, someone was supposed to be here, and when she wrote to the consulate to ask for a visa, all they said was, eventually maybe we'll give you an appointment someday. People from Italy tried phoning the people in the consulate and discovered that they didn't speak Italian. But eventually they got through the idea that yes, she is invited to a conference here and the conference is on and her flight leaves on the 18th why don't you give her an appointment before then? So they did. And they said, since, but it'll take us uh, several days, uh, something like a week to give you a visa, so you can have your visa for the 24th. And so she missed the conference. Now, these people 
obviously take delight in making someone else suffer. When I was young, people going to travel abroad were often told, you are going to be an, an ambassador for our country. Be sure to give a good impression of our country. Well, these people are, they work for the ambassador and they're giving a horrible impression of your country. And I think that this should be of concern to you. So there is a plan to set up a site called Vergogna Italia to post descriptions of how uh, consulates abroad treat people with the hope that this will eventually make them change. We're looking for people who would be willing to do some translating, uh, in particular from Spanish to Italian, not very often. Uh, the total volume won't be very much, but uh, once in a while if we get a story from someone about how he was treated, uh, say someone in South America, then we'll probably get it in Spanish. And in order to make it effective at carrying its message here, it has to be in Italian. So if you're willing to help occasionally with this translation, just send me mail. I think I understand that enough. I'm very much in favor of the global license because internet music sharing and sharing of whatever should be legal. Well, it's not over yet. Uh, the, the lower house voted to reject that idea, but uh, I heard that there's still hope the Senate will support the idea. So the fight's not over yet. problems with Firefox as it stands. First of all, the binaries that they distribute have a special license agreement which I think is not free. And second, the binaries that they distribute include a module which is not free at all and whose source code is not available. It's called TalkBack. So. Uh, somebody that I met yesterday has been working for a while on trying to prepare our distribution of Firefox uh, and uh, it will be entirely free software and have a it will not offer you non-free plugins to download and it will be designed also to protect against certain misleading and unfair practices like uh, zero size images being used to track people, to track who looks at ads and so on. Is that really true? <laughs> Did he say that this is being distributed in Windows Media? I don't know what video LAN is. What is this? Please, I need to know what's going... I don't care if it's Microsoft. For, you misunderstood totally. I gave instructions that this should not be streamed in anything except a format that free software can play. Were my instructions carried out or were they re ignored? Okay, I was... <laughs> a lot of people think that 
if pe uh, some people make the mistake of believing that Microsoft is the enemy, that the enemy is Microsoft, and that leads them to think that if it's not Microsoft, it's okay. But I don't care the identity of whoever tries to take away my freedom. I don't care if it's Microsoft or Apple or Oracle or whoever, or Adobe or a small company. I don't care. What I care about is, do I have freedom or not? So all non-free software is unethical. It doesn't matter whether it comes from Microsoft or someone else. Many people do help our community because they hate Microsoft, but although I appreciate their help, they're confused in their reasons. Basically, here at the university, at the labs and all the projects, we have to use prop uh, proprietary software. Students should start saying, on ethical grounds, I will not use proprietary software. Give me a way to do the same classwork with free software, to show I have learned the same things, to demonstrate the same skills, but using free software. Because you should not be forcing me to mistreat other people. It has to, ta it has to be an ethical stand. When you make it an ethical stand, then you have strength that you can use, that, with which you can win. And yes, it may be harder work if you use free software. And if you show you're willing to do extra work for the sake of your ethical principles, that commands respect. Yes, there's a Microsoft person in all of my speeches here. <laughs> Well, you have the right to your opinions, of course, even if there are horrible ones. I can't hear him. This is a problem. I can't hear him, but you probably can. The invitation to the audience is to uh, urge your university to get in touch with us, we are in touch with this university actually, to get the source code of Windows, which has been mentioned uh, but by Richard Salman, that, and uh, check together and with us, with our help if you want, if there are malicious uh, software or backdoors. Because so of course they're of inviting people to sign non-disclosure agreements and participate in Microsoft's project of checking their software to see if somebody in Al Qaeda has put in a back door. Uh, okay, I believe maybe, you. Maybe, maybe. The Just point is that you shouldn't help them because although they would like your help, they're not prepared to respect your freedom as a community. Maybe I don't agree with that. Now, another, another recommendation. Going back to the question, what, which kind of software should our university use? In our opinion, is the best software for the purpose of your job, of your activity. So he says, this our is not, university. No, wait, wait, Does he wait, work wait. for the university or for Microsoft? For the university. Of course. Well, first, what, you what, said you work for Microsoft. One, one recommendation, uh, I, I fully agree with some 
uh, items of this uh, speech with the ethic of the job, because ethic must be, in my opinion, everywhere. So, ethic is, uh, for example, is accessibility. So, be, be careful, because in most cases, most of the dis distribution of this free software is not good enough uh, in terms of accessibility. So, is accessibility is an issue for you, check that software against that. This is, of course, using the tail to wag the dog. The best software for the job. I agree, we should use the best software for every job. And what does best mean? Best in what sense? Best in a narrow technical sense? Or best in a social sense? See, I think the best software is always free software. Technically speaking, it may or may not be better. After all, the programmers at Microsoft are not stupid. They don't always do a bad job. Sometimes they do a good job. Technically speaking, our software may be better or it may be worse in any particular area. But ethically speaking, our software is always better. And that's more important. <clears throat> And if you have a choice, suppose you would like to have a program which is free software and works wonderfully, but suppose there isn't one. Suppose you have a choice between a free program that is missing certain important features or has some bugs and a user subjugating program which works better. Which of these gives you the possibility of getting to what you really want? Only the free program, because you could take this free program and you could fix whatever is deficient. You could find the bugs and correct them. You can add the missing features. You can do it yourself, or you can join together and put in money and pay someone to do it. But if you look at the proprietary program, there is nothing you can do to make it free. So there's no way, starting with this proprietary program, that you can get to a really satisfactory situation where you have freedom and the features you need. There's only one way to get there, and that's through here. So that's what you should do if you take the long-term view. In the long term, we can wait for whatever features we don't have yet. Because over time we can develop them. But we can't wait for freedom because giving up your freedom makes it harder to get that freedom back. So we have to stop asking questions like where do we want to go today and start asking questions like what kind of life do we want to be living 10 years from now? Allora c'è tempo giusto per altre due domande. Quindi ok. Well, your car isn't a computer, but it contains computers. And they probably are running proprietary software. And that is a serious problem. Lots of people like to change their cars. And they're having trouble changing their cars because they can't change the software. So given that this has become a real problem, I'd say cars ought to have free software in them. Ah, well, these are two different questions. I'll answer them both. First of all, when the government communicates with the public, it must use free standards, free file formats, free protocols, and so on. To send people word format is a very bad thing to do. 
And that's why when people send me word format, I refuse to try to read it. Now, I discovered once upon a time that if I just read the word file into Emacs, I can find the text in there somewhere. If I scroll down enough, and yes, it's true, there are ugly control characters in, in between, but I can read it. It's not convenient. In any case, I refuse to try because it's more useful to teach people to stop sending word format. So that's what I always do. However, so of course governments should never use these secret formats to communicate with the public. But the first question you, as you first asked it, is a broader question. Should public administrations use free software? And the answer is they must use only free software because they do their computing on behalf of the public with the public's data. And they have a responsibility to the public to maintain their full control over that computing. And that is inconsistent with the use of any non-free software. To use a non-free program in a public agency is to allow that aspect of their computing to fall under the control of private hands. And they must not ever do that. In fact, there is a right-wing politician in Spain who says that the public administration that, you, that doesn't use free software is not democratic. I don't remember his name, unfortunately. I don't know him very well. I saw him briefly. Uh, you could look it up, I'm sure. Uh, if you ask Pablo at Libre.org, he can tell you. He, know, he, he, know, he knows that person better and remembers the name be better than I do. Uh, in any case, uh, so this shows that there can be support for free software in public administrations from various parts of the political spectrum. All right. I would like to take this chance to thank uh, Mr. Stallman on behalf. Uh, did the packages arrive? Have we found them? Oh, well. But I do have some key rings that I can sell. <laughs> on behalf of the Free Software Foundation, uh, since I don't have very many, uh, in order to raise the most possible money, I'll sell them for 20 euros each which is a little more than usual due to the scarcity. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Naples uh, GNU Linux uh, user group, uh, Department of Engineering here in Naples, Hack Lab Cosenza, and uh, Ingenieria Senza Frontiere here in Naples for your dedication and time and teaching. Thank you. You're Signori, grazie a tutti. Vi ricordo che domani ci sarà anche un seminario sempre di Richard Salman all'Aula Magna di Via Partenope. Eh, Quest'ulteriore seminario è indirizzato più per far conoscere il free software nella pubblica amministrazione.